Okay, we are live and welcome to today's program. And uh, going to be talking about a uh, sensitive topic today, a topic that is um, a sad topic. It's a topic that is important uh, because of the, um, the history uh, of our country and because of the fact that it is legal, it's been legal uh, since January of 1972 um, to uh, have abortions. And um, I want to encourage anyone uh, that has guilt over uh, having either had an abortion or abortions uh, or having paid for one or having driven someone uh, to have one, uh, that there is forgiveness uh, for that sin. There is forgiveness. And uh, it's pretty staggering to think about um, the statistics. Um, there are probably well over 100 million Americans who have either had abortions or uh, are uh, have paid for them. And always remember, um, when there's an abortion, uh, it's because um, there's a mother and a father. And uh, so there are a lot of people uh, who are dealing with the trauma of knowing um, what they did. And having done a post-abortion uh, counseling uh, with people through the years, and I've, I've uh, tried to come alongside of individuals who have had abortions or paid for them or, or encouraged people to get them. Uh, there's all sorts of, of levels of involvement with um, with that issue that people can do. Um, but I want to encourage everyone first out of the gate that there is no sin that you can imagine that is greater than the love of God, than the forgiveness of God. And uh, Jesus is able to save and forgive uh, individuals um, who have had abortions, um, who have uh, murdered their own unborn children, and uh, sometimes more than one. Um, that's one thing in my own studies of, of the issue of abortion uh, through the years. A lot of abortion providers target um, women and try to get more than one uh, abortion from them uh, because very often when a, a woman has one, they will um, they will feel like they're not entitled that they, they don't deserve to have a child, and so they they won't uh, they won't keep any uh, of their children. But abortion really is the tail end. Uh, it's the the far extreme of the uh, total destruction of a family, because when you think about scripturally, biblically, um, God's people, and even even uh, people who were outside of God's people uh, in the Old Testament, uh, longed for children and wanted children. Uh, cried out to God for children, prayed for children. And uh, I've shared this illustration um, before as a fact in my own life. Um, I've shared this from the pulpit several times. I have heard only one Christian man in my entire life, one, pray that God would bless his family with children. One. I have heard one guy pray that. Now, I know that there's more that do pray that. I know there have been people who have asked me, uh, to pray that, that they'd be able to have children. But it's pretty shocking to me, though, when you look at um, what Scripture says about children being a blessing from God, being a heritage from the Lord, and um, that they're a, a, they're a privilege, that God is the one who opens and closes the womb. Um, one of my kids long ago, who's, who's older now, when he was little, said, why would, why would anyone want to prevent themselves from having more blessings? from God, because children are a blessing from God. And, you know, our own story as a family, I have 10 children, as I know many, many of you are aware of that. Um, but after we had the first four, you know, we stopped having children for a while because I just thought, man, at this, at this pace, uh, we're going to end up with like 17 kids. And I thought that's crazy. There's no way I could ever afford to feed that many kids. Um, but eventually God did a real big change in my heart, my wife's heart, and we had another child, my daughter, Lily. And uh, she was such a blessing to our family that my older kids actually got together and um, had a meeting. And then they met with Amy and me and told us that we should have at least three more so that each of them could have their own baby to, to watch and love and take care of. And uh, I laughed. I laughed at them when they said that. I said, kids, we... We might have one more. <laughs> Little did I know we were going to have five more. Um, so my own story uh, on this issue um, is not 
uh, like it was perfect from day one. And I just always understood children are a blessing and so on and so forth. And I'm also, I'm not, I don't teach, nor do I encourage people. You should have as many children as humanly possible. I always tell people, you know, try, try one and see how it goes and see how everybody's health is and, and things like that. But I do think that in general, we should have more as opposed to less. And we can usually afford more than we think. Um, if we're willing to do without, if we're willing to make sacrifices and things like that. So, but I want to talk about abortion. Why are Christians historically, why have Christians been uh, pro-life? Why have Christians been pro-life? Well, first of all, the, the scriptures teach us um, that uh, children are a blessing from God, that God is the one who opens the womb and uh, God is the one who blesses the marital union um, with children. And I've said this many times before, and I just need to keep saying it until it registers with people. But sex is not a right. Sex is a privilege only for the married people. And with sex comes responsibilities. And one of those responsibilities is the potential of having children. Now, abortion's history, um, obviously, it's been practiced on every continent. Um, in the world uh, throughout all of history. America is not unique uh, in that regard. And uh, it's a sad thing. Infanticide and abortion have been practiced uh, in every culture uh, under the sun. And so there's nothing unique about, about that. Um, but in America, uh, given our rather Christian roots, uh, it was illegal. Abortion obviously was illegal. It, sh it still should be uh, illegal. Uh, because it is the killing of innocent, uh, unborn human beings that are made in the image of God, no matter how they were conceived, no matter how or what circumstances they came into existence. So often people will bring up, what about rape or incest? And the simple response to that is, why would you murder the child conceived in incest? Why, why would you punish the baby for what someone else did? Now, I believe rape to be a capital crime. It's not, it should not be punishable by, you know, time in prison. Rape is a capital offense. I believe that individuals that do that should be put to death uh, by the state in a just society. That is what would happen. Um, but uh, children are, are not to be punished uh, for the circumstances by which they came into, into being. Um, and there's a, a story of Bodie Balcom um, has a child that he adopted and it was a, it was uh, incest or, and, and rape. And <clears throat> this woman sitting uh, in the waiting room at an abortion clinic suddenly had uh, her eyes opened while she was sitting there. And she just kind of thought this child didn't do anything. <laughs> this child should, did not do anything. And I should, I should allow this child to be born. And that child is, was adopted by the Balcom family. And you think, you know, that, that's, uh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful to hear that that happened. But there's a lot of stuff. I've got a lot of material here in front of me that I want to try to cover. I want to speak from my heart somewhat on this issue. But uh, when I was a sophomore in college, um, that would be in 1994 and 5, my pastor then uh, showed me a video by a focus on the family called The Hard Truth. And it's about abortion, about the history of abortion. And it's about what abortion does to babies. But the opening minutes of that film showed the most unforgettable, horrific images and video footage I have ever seen. It took the wind out of me for several weeks. I could not believe what I was actually seeing. It was worse than even some of the Holocaust footage that I had seen growing up in the public school system. Um, and also my father. Uh, had us watch uh, World War II documentaries and learn about what happened uh, in Nazi Germany. And my father was very pro-life, uh, very outspoken about that. But the horror of what abortion does to babies did not hit me until I saw that video at age 19. And those pictures were burned into my mind. And for several weeks, I had very little appetite. I felt like I'd been kicked in the stomach. And you think, how, how could the world be like this? Um, I've also uh, had to explain to my children um, when they reach a certain age what abortion is. And that's always a, a hard thing to do. H how do you explain to an eight-year-old girl what abortion is? H how do you explain what a dilation and curatage abortion 
is. How do you explain a partial birth abortion to a 10 year old girl? How do you explain a saline abortion where they inject high concentrated salt solution into the womb to burn a baby to death so that it's born dead? How do you explain what a digoxin injection to the heart to stop the fetal heartbeat? How do you explain that to people? People say, oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't explain it to anybody. Hey, that's the world we live in. They, one way or the other, they're going to find out what this is. They're going to find out this happens every day in this country. Now, <clears throat> I want to uh, share some illustrations with you. Um, my mother, my mother um, gave birth to me uh, when I was, uh, you know, in a, the year 1975. So that uh, was just a short time after Roe versus Wade after a court decision of all things it should have had no effect on any laws in this country because uh, the Supreme Court just makes decisions about cases. They don't determine what's right or wrong. Every state in this in this country should have said, we don't care that you guys are dumb enough to get a decision like that wrong. We're not changing anything. But all those abortion laws were struck down January 22nd, 1973, Roe versus Wade. And then the, the lesser known case of Doe versus Bolton happened. And so the, uh, the Holocaust started and uh, um, children were being uh, aborted right and left uh, legally. And the um, some of the architects of that, of a fellow named Bernard Nathanson, um, who was himself an abortion doctor and performed many tens of thousands of abortions, um, flat out says that he lied in some of the data that was presented. Um, there were not you know, thousands of back alley abortions or anything like that going on in America. And the simple fact is within a very short period of time, the number of abortions happening in America increased by a factor of 1,500% shortly after it was legalized. It, it legalized. It's really amazing that once something becomes legal, people start thinking it's okay. But I called my mother after I started studying abortion years ago, and uh, I told her, mom, I just wanted to thank you for having me since you could have exercised your so-called right to choose. I'll never forget what my mom told me. She said, Patrick, I wanted you more than you can imagine. And I absolutely loved being pregnant with you. you know, I'm, I'm very blessed. I consider myself blessed to be alive. We, we don't think about this as often as we should. Those of us born in 1970, uh, after January 22nd, 1973, one in three children in America are aborted. I mean, folks, think about that. A third, a third of the people that you would have known, that you would have had as your friends, that you would have sat in church with, a third of the people that you would have known in your life are dead. They were killed before they were born. People think, oh, abortion, that happens over in these clinics. That has nothing to do with me. Oh, yes, it does. Oh, yes, it does. So many people that you would have known are dead. I've often wondered, I wonder if one of those people would have cured cancer. I wonder if one of those people would have figured out the, the cure for autism. I wonder if one of those people would have composed the greatest symphonies the world's ever heard. I wonder if one of those individuals would have written the greatest works on systematic theology ever written. All that potential, all those people, dead, gone. Well, abortion has nothing to do with women's rights. It has nothing to do with the so-called right to choose or right to privacy. If you think that way, if you, if you ever have held up a sign or have seen the signs of people that hold up signs that say, not your body, not your choice, it's actually ironically true because that, the baby in your womb is not yours. It's God's. You don't have the right to kill it. Not your body, not your choice, or trust women, or we're pro-choice, or abortion saves women's lives. I've seen signs like that as I've been at abortion clinics, especially when I lived in Ohio. Used to, you know, we'd see those signs everywhere. You can know for sure that people that say things like that are utterly ignorant of the real issue before us. They are utterly ignorant of the real issue before us. In fact, I want to tell you another story. When uh, I lived in Ohio, there was an abortion clinic that opened up less than two miles away from the church. And we used to go down there and uh, we did talk women out of having abortions. And what, I actually got to hold one of those babies. It was a, a woman from Ethiopia. And we actually talked her into getting a sonogram. This, this was her fifth child. 
Uh, she already had four. She just did not think she could handle having another one. She was 20 weeks pregnant. She was there for her abortion. And we talked her into getting a sonogram. As soon as she saw that baby on the, on the screen, the tears started flowing. And she said, there's no way I can do this. And we immediately raised the money. I just made an appeal to the church. We immediately raised $3,100 for her to have a, a scheduled C-section because of her health issues. And I got to hold that baby in my own arms. It was, it was really, really remarkable. But the security guard at that abortion clinic, we actually befriended him. And I went out to lunch with him a couple times, uh, two times. And we sat down to eat lunch. And this guy <laughs> immediately launches into me. I mean, we sat down and he just went off. <laughs> you know, he's cussing, swearing, and you guys blah, 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 just did. These women, they're already under enough stress, and you guys are making it even worse. And he is just going off. Women have the right to, to their own self-determination. Who are you to tell them what they can do with their own body? Blah, 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 just laying into me. And he finally got done talking. And I said to him, um, I agree with almost everything you just said. But everything you just said, pretty much everything you just said, has nothing to do with abortion. Nothing. And he was like, what do you mean it has nothing to do with abortion? I said, it has nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with abortion. The so-called you know, women's rights or anything like that has nothing to do with abortion. Nothing. So immediately I had his attention. I said, abortion is about one question. One question. What is the unborn? What is it? What is the unborn? And I used this illustration. I told him, I have a bunch of kids. And let's say I'm working on something in my backyard. And I'm hammering something, I'm up on a ladder, and I'm really focused on it. And one of my kids walks up behind me, and I can't see them. I can't see them. And they say, hey, Dad, can I kill this? What do you think my next question is going to be? <laughs> what is it? What is it that you want to kill, son? Now, if I'm able to turn around, and he's got a mosquito on his hand, I would say, yeah, sure, go ahead. If he's got his younger brother in a headlock, it's going to affect my answer to his question. Hey, Dad, can I kill this? Well, son, it depends on what this is, right? And so I told that abortion and clinic security guard, the only question that matters is what is in the womb of a pregnant woman? What is it that you want to kill? And I asked him, what's in the womb of all these pregnant women? And he just kind of sheepishly, a baby. I said, right. So when is it okay to kill a baby? And I'll never forget what he says. He said, yeah, I guess it is a pretty blanky thing to do. <laughs> and so all of his yammering, all of his going off about women's rights was diffused with one simple question. What is the unborn? If the unborn are living human persons, what does that mean abortion is? Murder. If the unborn are not living human persons, I wouldn't care about it then. I would not care about abortion. If the unborn, if the unborn are not people, if they are not living human persons, then I would no more care about abortion than I care about people clipping their fingernails. But that shows us there's only one question that matters. What is it? Now, I have to say, long ago, Barack Hussein Obama was interviewed by uh, Rick Warren. And, and he asked him, when does a baby get rights? At what point does an unborn child get, get rights? And Obama said, oh, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> when does human life begin? I don't know. So it's above my pay grade. Y'all need to understand something. When you hear people say that, nobody knows when life begins. We actually do. It begins at conception. Everybody knows that. The only thing that's added to that cell is nutrition. Everything that you and I are is contained in that cell. Everything. There is nothing added to it that makes it something that it wasn't before. 
But Obama said, that's above my pay, right? Nobody knows when life begins. Folks, you need to understand something. When people say nobody knows for sure when life begins, which is a false statement, but let's just play devil's advocate. We'll, just, we'll go along with it for a moment. That's an argument against abortion. If you say no one knows for sure when life begins, you're saying it might begin at conception. So abortion might be murder. Now, folks, uh, let me illustrate it this way. Let's say that I've rigged the uh, the TNT to demolish an old building. Okay, a big, huge skyscraper over there. A bunch of people gathered around. The TV stations are there, and all the dynamite's wired, and I've got the button here, and I'm getting ready to push it. It's going to be recorded. It's going to be on TV. It's going to be really cool. And someone comes to me and says, okay, Patrick, is everybody out of the building? If I said to them, yeah, I'm pretty sure. What would you think if I went ahead and blew up the building? Wouldn't you say, no, Patrick, you need to, you need to be sure there's nobody in there. And what if my response to that was, well, I'm, nobody knows for sure if, if, if everybody's out, but I, I'm, I'm fairly sure that everyone's out of the building. What would you think of me if I went ahead and blew up the building? If people say, well, we don't know for sure when life begins. They're saying there might be someone in the building. And what's going to happen if I push the button? They're going to die. They're going to get killed. The argument that no one knows when life begins is an argument against abortion because it is acknowledging it might begin at conception. Now, we do know life begins at conception. Everyone knows that. And really, almost before the, the child can even be detected, its heart's already beating. All right, a little history, a little history. Um, easy abortion on demand has nothing to do with trying to save women's lives. Easy abortion on demand has nothing to do with women's so-called rights to choice. Their right to privacy has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with taking away a woman's sovereignty over her own body. Here, here's what abortion is. Are y'all listening? Abortion, plainly stated, is a backup plan to failed contraception. That's all. That's all it's ever been. Abortion is a backup plan for failed contraception. Let me tell you the, the morbid story. In 1953, Margaret Sanger, who was um, a racist against black people, uh, founder of the what was called the American Birth Control League, known today as Planned Parenthood, persuaded a rich, frustrated, child-hating feminist named Catherine McCormick to bankroll hormone experiments on women. So they found 897 test subjects, married women who did not want children, who were willing to take a pill. And you know what? The pill worked. No babies. And how does the pill work? It tricks your body into thinking you're pregnant so you don't ovulate. But the side effects of this pill were rather disastrous. While the pill did work, it was found to cause blood clots, heart attacks, strokes, depression, weight gain, and a loss of libido. So they continued working on it, working on it, scaling back the amount of estrogen in it in order to curtail the side effects. And that worked too. The side effects were, were mitigated. But one of the side effects of cutting back the amount of hormones and the drugs themselves was they didn't work as well at preventing conception. So now you have women who are sexually active who do not want children and are taking a pill to stop themselves from having children, but they're getting pregnant. Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade. Abortion is a backup plan for failed contraception. Plain and simple. That's what it is. And what's ironic to me is um, <laughs> the um, Jane Roe in uh, Roe Ro versus uh, Wade there, uh, Norma McCorvey, the, the lady that they um, those uh, lawyers kind of uh, collared into being their, um, the person they were pushing to try to get this abortion stuff through. She, uh, the, the legal rigmarole took so long, she ended up having the baby. <laughs> she, Norma McCorvey had the baby and eventually got saved and became an outspoken pro-life advocate. Just, I find that just amazing. The, the woman that was part of that original trial, Roe versus Wade, Norma McCorvey, got saved and had her child. 
Okay. She was originally the one that was wanting an abortion, but the, it took so long. She, you know, she had the baby. And please remember that abortion is a backup plan for failed contraception. All of the shallow lies about women's rights and all the rest of that is a smokescreen. Abortion is about money. It's about exploiting women and using them to make money. Abortion is an industry in America. In fact, it's a very largely unregulated cash only industry that is bizarre and frightening to study. I've read the testimonies of former abortion clinic workers, former abortion doctors who have come to their senses and are now outspoken pro-life people because of the unspeakable brutality of so much of what they saw. Uh, I read once a story about a reporter who was chewing out and arguing with pro-life people outside of an abortion clinic where partial birth abortions were being performed. And finally, a doctor from the clinic came out and motioned to the reporter to come inside. And the doctor said to him, just come in here and watch one of these. You'll see there's nothing to fuss about. The reporter was profoundly shaken by what he saw by watching a partial birth abortion and changed his mind on the issue after seeing it. An article in the New York Times by a very liberal pro-abortion woman writer was also stunning. She attended and observed a partial birth abortion and described it as, quote, profoundly disturbing and also said she found it difficult to hold her eight-month-old baby when she returned home. And the final line of her article said about observing this partial birth abortion, this is a pro-choice feminist liberal writer for the New York Slimes, I mean, Times. She said this, quote, I have seen that fetus in my dreams, end quote. Now, you know what's amazing to me is there. there's a psalm in the word of God that I actually preached on it once, and I called that sermon God's Song to Abortion Providers. God's Song to Abortion Providers. I just want to read it to you. I just want to read this psalm to you. It's Psalm 10. Listen to God's word. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lies low that the helpless may fall by his strength. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. But you have seen. For you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress No more. God's judgment is in his hands, and he will certainly repay everyone. Every drop of innocent blood that has been shed on this planet, just like that of Abel, cries out to God. Cries out to God for vengeance. There's a a famous song uh, that it's called Malediction, and the, the word Malediction means curse. And I wanted to read the lyrics of this uh, poem to you, if I can find it. Um, Malediction. 
because I think I can remember it. The judges sat outside the law, and in their pride, no evil saw, in setting teeth to Satan's jaw and feeding him our children. A curse, a curse, the law it cries. A curse, a curse on mankind's pride. A curse on him who dares to flout God's image in mankind. Yeah, let me find it. I got to find that. Mankind. Let me see if I can find the that addiction song. Yeah, here we go. Malediction. Ugh. Yeah. When viewed in terms of cost and ease, an unborn child is a disease. A holocaust seen fit to please our own convenience. A curse, a curse, the law it cries. A curse, a curse on mankind's pride. A curse on him who would deny God's image in mankind. Torn from out their mother's womb, denied the sky, denied a tomb. Conceived in lust to their own ruin, a sacrifice to pleasure. The doctors with their blood red hands who love their money more than man. With greed their God, they lay their plans. The butchers of mankind. A curse, a curse, the, the blood cries out. A curse, a curse, the heavens shout. A curse, a curse on he who flouts. God's image in mankind. And listen to this last stanza. O oh, rid us of this evil Lord and turn our hearts by cross or sword. Our nation cannot long afford to lay beneath your anger. A curse, a curse upon their heads. O oh, save them, Lord, or slay them dead and fill our nation with your dread and turn away your anger. That song was actually played at the beginning of that Focus of the, on the Family video. But I want to talk to you about how to defend unborn life. It's actually really easy. If you can remember the that one question, what is the unborn, you'll pretty much win every uh, <laughs> every discussion you ever get in uh, get into on this issue. Uh, because, you know, if you get people focused on what abortion actually is, instead of allowing yourself to be distracted by all the yammering about women's rights and everything else. If you focus people on what abortion does to babies, you will win um, the debates. Here's a good quote from um, Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, AKA Murder Incorporated. She says, quote, our objective is unlimited sexual gratification without the burden of unwanted children. Women must have the rights to live, to love, to be lazy, to be an unmarried mother, to create, to destroy. The marriage bed is the most degenerative influence in the social order. The most merciful thing that a family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. End quote. Sweet lady. Yeah. Margaret Sanger. Um, she called black people human weeds. She was a racist bigot. Okay. Uh, a racist bigot. Um, yeah, brother, I'll, I'll find that, um, uh, that sermon link here for you. Um, but I want to talk to you about how to defend unborn life, how to defend unborn life. Uh, real quick, there's a lady named Gianna Jessen, and uh, she addressed um, Parliament uh, at Queen's Hall in Victoria, Australia, uh, on the eve of the debate to decriminalize abortion. So they're, they were going to decriminalize abortion. This is in 2008. She survived a saline abortion and has cerebral palsy as a result of the uh, injuries that she received. Her mother was seven months pregnant with her. I've got her story, uh, a book um, about her story. It's an incredible story. Listen to what this young woman said to Parliament, quote, For a brief moment, I would like to speak to the men in this room and to do something that is never done. Men. You are made for greatness. You are made to stand up and be men. You're made to defend women and children, not to stand by when murder is occurring and do nothing about it. You're not made to use women and leave us alone. You're made to be kind and great and gracious and strong and stand for something. Because men, listen to me. I'm too tired to do your job. 
Women, you are not made for abuse. You are not made to sit and not know your worth and your value. You are made to be fought for forever. So now is your moment. What sort of people are you going to be? I trust incredible. I trust men, you will rise to the occasion. To the politicians listening, particularly to the men, I would say this. You are made for greatness. Set your politics aside. You are made to defend what is right and good. And this fiery young girl will stand here and say, now is your moment. What sort of man do you want to be? A man obsessed with your own glory or a man obsessed with the glory of God? It is time to take a stand, Victoria. This is your hour. God will assist you. God will be with you. You have the opportunity to glorify and honor God. I'll end with this. Some of you might slightly be annoyed that all I keep doing is talking about God and Jesus. But how on earth can I walk about limping through this world and not give all my heart and mind and soul and strength to the Christ who gave me life? So if you think I'm a fool, it's just another jewel in my crown. My whole intent in living here is to make God smile. I hope some of this made sense. It just came from my heart. She says this, quote, I know that in the age we live in, it's not at all politically correct to say the name of Jesus Christ in places like this. She's addressing Parliament in Australia. She says, to bring Jesus into these sorts of meetings because his name can make people so terribly uncomfortable. But I did not survive an abortion so I could make people comfortable. I survived so I could stir things up a bit and I have a great time doing it. Gianna Jessen, she's a she's a firebrand. Uh, really like her, really appreciate her. But what about speaking in behalf of the unborn? It's not an option. Proverbs 31, 8, you open your mouth for the speechless in the cause of all who are appointed to die. Proverbs 31, 8, open your mouth for the speechless in the cause of all who are appointed to die. Proverbs 24, 11, deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? I want to tell you all, um, by the mercy of Almighty God, by his mercy alone, every pastoral prayer I've ever prayed since I was ordained, I have asked God to end abortion in every single one of them. And I'm going to do that until abortion is done, until it's stopped. The Christian church, the Christian church, sadly, has been missing in action on this issue and has been very, very, very quiet on this issue because it's politically incorrect and because people get angry when you do that. There have been people, people who have moved to this area looking for a church to go to, and uh, they don't like that. They don't like that I pray that God would end abortion every single Sunday. And, you know, I have to, I have to say, um, I don't care that that bothers people. This is the greatest moral atrocity in the history of this country. And we've had a lot of moral atrocities in this country, for sure. But this is the worst one. This is the single biggest moral disaster in the history of America. We have to open our mouths and speak. We have to say, this is wrong. It's wrong to rip a child limb from limb and then reassemble their body on a Petri dish to make sure you got it all. It is wrong to put high concentration salt solution into the womb of a pregnant woman to kill the child. It is wrong to do that. It is immoral to do that. Now, people um, want to know, well, does the Bible explicitly address abortion? Well, it's really not even a category uh, because even pagans wanted children um, in biblical history. Uh, but the idea that uh, there's not an explicit text uh, dealing with this is nonsense. One of the things that we know from Scripture, we know from Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan, when he was asked, well, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Uh, and um, Jesus tells the parable of um, the, uh, the man that went to Jericho, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves. And a priest and a Levite see him and skip him. They don't want to mess with it. And a Samaritan 
um, does the right thing. Why do people ask that? Who who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? They're not wanting to know. Well, who who all do I need to love? Who I I, I want to love everybody. People ask that question because they want to know who can I exclude? Who doesn't count as a person? And that's what abortion does. Abortion is the ultimate example of someone going. Well, who is my neighbor? Well, the only people that are really my neighbors are people that are born. You know, there was a, a an article by a, a feminist uh, named Mary Elizabeth Williams on Salon.com uh, a few years ago. And it was called, So What If Abortion Ends a Life? In the article, here it is. The article is so shocking to read. Because for so long, for such a long time, um, people tried to depersonalize the child and say, well, it's just a clump of tissue. It's just a product of conception. It's a tissue blob and so on and so forth. And here, Mary Elizabeth Williams is saying, so what if it's a life? So what if it's a person? So what? Who cares? Okay. Now, um, Let's see. Uh, where does she say that? Passing um, through the birth canal. Birth canal. Yeah. Where she she actually says there's nothing magical about passing through a birth canal that turns someone into a person. Okay? I mean, it's like we've been saying that for decades. We've been saying that for decades. Okay? She says... Um, when we try to act like a pregnancy doesn't involve human life, we wind up drawing stupid semantic lines in the sand. First trimester abortion versus second trimester abortion versus late term. Dancing around the issue, trying to decide if there's a single magic moment when a fetus becomes a person. Are you, listen, this is a, fe a feminist, liberal feminist, Mary Elizabeth Williams. She says, are you human only when you're born? Only when you're viable outside of the womb? Are you less of a human when you look like a tadpole than when you can suck your thumb? You hear what she's saying? She's saying, you're human the whole time. And who cares if abortion ends a life? This is what she says at the end of this article. She says, some argue that abortion takes lives, but I know that abortion saves lives too. Okay, she's quoting from someone else. She understands that it saves lives, not just in the most medically literal way, but in the roads that women who have, who have choice then get to go down in the possibilities for them and their families. And I would put the life of a mother over the life of a fetus every single time. Listen, even if I still need to acknowledge my conviction that the fetus is indeed, is indeed a life, a life worth sacrificing. That is a manifesto for the most cruel, died in the wool, cold hearted, ruthless, ideology I've ever heard. My life's more important than someone else's. And in fact, if their life gets gets in the way of what I want to do with my life, I will sacrifice them. Okay, well, at least you have someone who's willing to, you know, say it the way it really is. I, I did a podcast on that article years ago. When was that written? That was written in 2013. That's 11 years ago she said that. I remember reading that article and thinking, boy, um, she's saying there's nothing about, you know, being outside the womb or inside the womb. You're still alive. Um, if I was, if I was one of Mary Elizabeth Williams children, I don't know if she has children, but I would sleep with one eye open because if I get in the way of what she wants to do, Hey, my life's worth sacrificing. <laughs> my life's uh, not important to her. And she could just kind of, you know, snuff me out there and, uh, kill me because her life's more important than mine. I just find that kind of crassness to be shocking mary elizabeth williams incredible okay could you get behind the abolition of abortion i'm totally uh, for the abolition of abortion totally completely that's why i'm not in favor of regulating it i'm not in favor of stricter laws it needs to be abolished completely abolished completely now the basic premise of us saying that abortion is immoral, that abortion is murder and is, is wrong, is this. There's three, three things. It is morally wrong to take the life of an innocent human being. Two, elective abortion takes the life of an innocent human being. Three, 
therefore elect elective abortion is morally wrong. Um, one thing that you can also do when you dialogue with people about um, abortion, people will use these arguments. And folks, I want to encourage you. You need to remember this. I'm going to actually put it over here in the chat thing. It's called trot out your toddler. Apply their argument. Apply their argument to a toddler. People will say abortion is a matter between a woman and her God. Okay, question. Is killing a toddler between a woman and her God? And they'll say, but that's a different issue. A toddler's a real person, which takes us back to the real issue. What's, what is the unborn? What is the unborn? You can defeat every objection people give you by driving them back to that question. What is the unborn? Another one. Many poor women can't afford another child. Okay, response. Can we kill a toddler because we can't afford them? And they'll say, oh, that's a different issue. A toddler's a real person, which goes back to the issue. Well, what is the unborn? You're saying they're not a person? Three. If abortion is restricted, women will die in back alley abortions. Response, should women be able to kill toddlers safely in abortion clinics because it's unsafe to kill them in back alleys? Folks, trot out your toddler. No matter what they say, apply it to a toddler and they will object to it. Unless you're Peter Singer, who thinks we should kill toddlers or have the right to kill them. But most most normal people with, with somewhat intact consciences um, are, are still functioning that way. A fourth one. Yeah, Scott Klusendorf's book, A Case for Life, highly recommend it. Let me put that. It's called A Case for Life by Klusendorf. Thank you, Rebecca. That's a great, great, great book. And uh, Pro-Life 101 by um, um, uh, Greg Kokel. Greg Kokel. Uh, Pro-Life 101 um, by Greg Greg Kokel. I spelled it as, as, as it's a K-O-U-K-L, Kokel. <laughs> Those are great books. Okay, women should not be forced to bear unwanted children. Okay, response. The homeless are unwanted. Should we kill them? But the homeless are real people, which takes us back to what is the unborn? You shouldn't force your morality on women. You shouldn't force your own morality on women. And our response to that is women shouldn't force their morality upon their unborn children. So when you hear objections and when you hear those kinds of arguments, Trot out the toddler, apply their argument to a toddler, and then watch them squirm and they'll say, That doesn't, that's not a valid parallel. Those are real people. Okay, so that brings us back to the question um, What is the unborn? We differ from the unborn in four ways. And you can, it's a good acronym. Scott Klusendorf uses it S L E D. Okay, size, I'll put it, put it here in the, in the chat thing, level of development. Um, uh, environment and degree of dependency. Dependency. Okay, size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency. We differ from the unborn only in those four ways. We're bigger. Folks, how big we are has nothing to do with what we are. Okay, we don't believe Shaquille O'Neal is more valuable because he's a lot bigger than us, right? I've heard people say, well, it's not like an acorn. It's not like an acorn is an oak tree. An, an, acorn, an acorn isn't an oak tree. And it's like, actually, yes, it is. <laughs> an acorn is a little oak tree with a sack lunch attached to it. That's what a seed is. Okay. So that's the first thing, size. All right. Level of development. A newborn is more developed than the unborn, and I am more developed than an unborn child. A toddler is more developed than a newborn. Folks, our value does not increase the older we get. An eight-year-old is not more valuable than a toddler. Our level of development is not relevant to what we are. So how big we are isn't relevant to what we are. And how developed we are also is not relevant to what we are. Okay, environment is the third one, SLED. Remember, S-L-E-D, size, level of development, environment. Where I am has no bearing on what I am. Mary Elizabeth Williams even says that. There's nothing about traveling down a birth canal that magically turns you into something you weren't before. Okay, it doesn't. It doesn't. And that's why so many of the laws are so evil. It's like, well, if it's accidentally born, then we have to treat it. What happened in it being born that made it 
you you're legally obligated to hook it up to machines to try to keep it alive when it, it being six inches somewhere else you were you were trying to kill it before that's lunacy that's crazy folks where i am has no bearing on what i am okay when i wake up in the morning i move from my bed to the kitchen to start making coffee now, was I still the same person in bed that I was when I got to the kitchen? Yes. What is in the womb of a pregnant woman is the same thing when it comes outside of the pregnant woman. Isn't that obvious? Okay, if I have an orange in a paper sack, and then I take the orange out of the paper sack, is it still an orange? Yeah. Now, folks, I had to go to seminary to learn that one. I mean, this is common sense. Where I am has no bearing on what I am. Environment and then degree of dependency. This is the issue the Supreme Court keyed in on. The issue of, quote unquote, viability. The ability to survive on its own outside the mother's womb. So as long as babies are completely dependent on their mothers, they don't count as human beings with the right to live. Well, folks, this really hits close to home. <clears throat> um, because... My father was dependent on kidney dialysis for years. Does that mean that, well, he's he's dependent. He can't survive on his own, so he doesn't have the right to live then. I have a, I, you know, pe people with, with diabetes are totally dependent on insulin. Does that mean that their lives are not, are, are not, should not be protected by the law? Folks, listen, the degree of dependency that you have is not relevant to what you are. It's not relevant to what you are. Every attempt to depersonalize the unborn child fails scientifically and rationally. Now, in closing here, man, I've been talking for 51 minutes. Good grief. I just want to go over a couple things. I want to go, go through the early stages of child development. Early stages of child development. Fact. The vast majority of abortions are performed upon children that are 12 weeks of gestation or less. The first day, fertilization. All human chromosomes are present, and a distinct human life now exists. Day six, the embryo implants itself into the uterine wall. Day 22, the heart begins to beat with the child's own blood, often with a different blood type from its mother. 22 days. That child's heart is beating and pumping its own blood. The third week, the child's backbone, spinal column, and nervous system are forming. The liver, kidneys, and intestines begin to take shape. Week four, the child is now 10,000 times larger than the fertilized egg. <laughs> if we continued growing at the same rate that we do those first four weeks, Every baby ever born would weigh an average of 28,000 pounds when it was born. There is so much that happens in those first four weeks. It is astounding. And if we, as I said, if we continued to grow at that rate, the average baby would weigh 28,000 pounds when it was born. Week five, eyes, legs, and hands begin to develop. Week six, brain waves are detectable. Mouth and lips are present. Fingernails are forming. Week seven, eyelids and toes form. The nose is now distinct. The baby is kicking and swimming. Week eight, every organ is now in place. The bones begin to replace cartilage and fingerprints begin to form. By the eighth week, the baby can hear. Week nine and ten, teeth begin to form. Fingernails develop. The baby can now turn her head and frown. The baby can also hiccup. Week 10 and 11, the baby can now breathe the amniotic fluid in the womb in and out of its lungs. Week 11, the baby can grasp objects placed in its hands. All organs are now functioning. The baby has a skeletal structure, nerves, and circulation. Week 12, the baby has all the parts necessary to experience pain, including nerves, spinal cord, and thalamus. Vocal cords are now complete, and the baby can suck its thumb. 68% of 
of the 1.21 million abortions that will be done in America this year will be done on babies that are right around 12 weeks gestation. The baby has all the parts necessary to experience pain, including nerves, spinal cord, and thalamus. Vocal cords are now present and complete, and the baby can suck its thumb. What could be more tragic? The church is under the judgment of God for being quiet about this. And shame on any Christian who is too cowardly, is too afraid of people being mean to them or hating on them, if they say abortion is murder. Because it ends innocent human life. We differ from the unborn. Those four ways, size, level of development, environment, degree of dependency, abortion has nothing whatsoever to do with women's rights, the right of personal sovereignty or anything like that. Abortion was and is a backup plan for failed contraception. And that's all it has ever been. Every argument that people come up with against abortion or come up, come up with for abortion, apply it to toddlers when you hear it. And then you'll hear them say, well, that's different because that, that's a real person. Folks, scientifically, we know. We know what's in that womb. Everyone knows. Everyone knows. What is the unborn? What is the unborn? The unborn are living human persons. And that's why abortion is murder. Children are a blessing in whatever circumstances they're conceived, whether they're healthy or unhealthy. They are a blessing from God, and we should welcome all of them into the world. Thank you all for watching or for listening.